Hey everyone, in this lecture we will discuss the running time of an algorithm. The running time of an algorithm may depend upon several factors. Let's discuss each of the factor one by one. It depends upon whether our program is using single processor or multiple processors for execution. Because if our program is using single processor, then we cannot execute our program parallelly. So it depends upon whether our program is using single processor or multiple processors. It also depends upon what is the read and write speed of our program to the memory or to the disk. It may also depends upon the architecture of the computer, whether the computer is based on 32-bit architecture or 64-bit architecture. It also depends upon the configuration of the machine. It also depends upon the input, how our program behaves with different input. In our analysis, we are just concerned about input, not any other factor. We are just concerned about input in our analysis. So we need to evaluate time as a function of input. Okay, to make it simple, let's first create a model machine. Let's say I have created a model machine, which is having single processor, it is based on 32 bit architecture, and the flow of instructions in this machine are sequential. And this machine is taking one unit of time for arithmetic and logical operations, where I define arithmetic operations as addition, multiplication, division, those sort of Operations are basically arithmetic operations and logical operations are basically AND, OR, ZOR. So those sort of operations are basically logical operations. And let's say my model machine is taking one unit of time for assignment as well as a return statement. Let's say A is equal to B. This is one of the assignment statement. Okay. Now let's evaluate the running time of our algorithm based on our model machine. Let's start with a very simple example. Let's say I define a function which calculates the sum of two numbers. The function will be something like this. Now let's evaluate the execution time for this simple algorithm. As we can see that this function has only one instruction. And in this instruction, we have one arithmetic statement as well as one return statement. And as per our model machine, we know that arithmetic statements take one unit of time and return statements also take one unit of time. So in total, this whole instruction will take two units of time. As we can see that irrespective of my input, this function will always complete in two units of time. So in this case, my TN will always be equal to two. So we can say that in this case, my function is a constant function. Now let's discuss some other examples. Now let's say I let's define a function which calculates the sum of a list. Let's say I have a function which takes two arguments, the list as well as the size of the list. I have defined my total, which is equal to zero. I iterate over my list and I am adding all the elements of the list in my total. And in the end, I'm returning my total. So as we can see that in this case, we have four instructions, instruction one, instruction two, instruction three, instruction four. Let's calculate the running time for each instruction. As we can see that for the first instruction, we have just only one assignment statement. If we have only one assignment statement, that means it takes only one unit of time. In the second instruction, we need to iterate over the list. So if I want to iterate over the list, I need to increment my i as well as I need to compare my i with the size of my list. So in this case, I have one comparison statement as well as I have one increment operation. So in total, I have two operations in my second instruction. So this is this will take two units of time. So for the third instruction, I have an arithmetic statement as well as I have one assignment statement. So in total, the third instruction will also take two units of time. In the fourth instruction, I just have only return statement. So this will take one unit of time. Now let's see how many times I need to execute my each instruction. As we can see that I need to execute my first instruction only one time, but I need to execute my second instruction as I need to iterate over my list. I need to execute this n plus one time where n is the size of list. I need to execute my third instruction n times because I need to add all the elements of list in the total. And I need to execute my fourth instruction only one time. 
So if I want to evaluate overall execution time of this algorithm, it will come something like 1 plus 2 into n plus 1 plus 2n plus 1. So in total, it will appear something like 4n plus 4. So as we can see that in this case, our running time depends upon input. It comes as a function of input. And we can see that this is basically some sort of linear function. Fine. So let's have a question time. So what will be the time complexity as a function of input for a sum of matrix? As we can see that in the case of matrix, we will have some sort of n square elements. So if I want to calculate the sum of my matrix, then I need to iterate over my each element. Fine. So what does it mean? It means my running time, it's kind of a quadratic function and then it will appear something like this. And we can easily prove it based on our model machine. So in this lecture, we have learned how to calculate the running time as a function of input. So thank you guys. Hey guys, in the previous lecture, we learned how to calculate time as a function of input. But in this lecture, we will map our running time into some sets. Okay, let's first discuss the intuition behind sets. Let's say we have two functions where the first function is t1n which is equal to 6n square plus 3n plus 4 and I have some other function t2n which is equal to 6n square plus and we know how to evaluate such functions based on our program. As I already discussed this thing in the previous lecture based on our model machine. Okay, now what will be the rate of both the functions when n tends to infinity? Okay, let's try to evaluate both the functions when n is equal to 100. And we get some values like this. Now let's evaluate when n is equal to 10,000. Then the value will be something like this. When we evaluate when n is equal to 10 lakhs, then the value will be something like this. As we can see that effect of lower terms is getting lesser and lesser in a way that we can ignore lower terms as when n tends to infinity. As we can see that these terms has no effect when we have n is equal to 10 lakh. So we can say that when n tends to infinity, t1n is approximately equal to t1n t2n. So we just got the idea that there are many functions which will behave in a similar way when n tends to infinity. So that's why. So why not keep all these functions into the same set? This is basically the intuition behind sets. Okay, let's define our first category of our set, which is big O notation and which we call as asymptotic notation as well. Okay, we define asymptotic notation or big O notation as, let's say we have a function fn, which we evaluate based on our model machine and, and we figured out two constants c and n nodes such that this condition holds where fn is always less than equal to cgn for all great and greater than equal to n. Then we can map those sort of functions into set gn. Fine. Let's say we have a function fn which is equal to 5n square plus 2n plus 1. Let's say I define gn as n square and I figured out when n0 is equal to 1 and c is equal to 8. In that case, this property is holds where fn is always less than equal to 8n square when n is greater than n0 where we have n0 is equal to 1 and c is equal to 8. Let's try to visualize this graph. In this graph we can see that after n0 cgn it's always greater than fn. So that's why we can say that big O is basically upper bound of rate of growth of time. Fine, let's define the second category of our sets, which we call as omega notation. In this case, we def let's say we have a fn and there exists c and n node such that cgn is less than equal to fn for n greater than equal to n node. Fine, let's say I have the same function fn which is equal to f5n square plus 2n plus 1 and I have gn which is equal to n square. Let's say I figure out c as 5 and n0 as 0. 
then I can surely say that fn is always greater than or equal to 5n square when n0 is equal to 0 and c is equal to 5. So as we can see in the graph that fn always exceeds cgn after n0. Fine. So that's why we can say that omega notation it's always represent the lower bound of rate of growth of time. Fine. So now let's discuss the third category of our sets, which is theta notation. So for a theta notation, we defined our function fn. Let's say we calculate that function and there exist constants c1, c2 and n naught such that c1 gn is less than or equal to fn and it's less than or equal to c2 gn for all n greater than or equal to n naught. Let's say we have a function which is equal to 5n square plus 2n plus 1 and we have c1 is equal to 5, c2 is equal to 8 and n0 is equal to 1. When we plot the graph, we will get something like this. And we can also see that fn is less than 8n square and it is greater than 5n square. So we have our c1 is equal to 5, c2 is equal to 8 and n0 is equal to 1. So after n0, we can see that our c2 gn, it's always greater than fn and c1 gn, it's always less than fn. So we can say that theta n square basically the tight bound of our algorithm. So it's always a good idea to evaluate the runtime of an algorithm in theta notation. So that's all about the sets guys. Thank you.